second in our series on human evolution. We're going to be talking about the differences and similarities between humans and the great apes. When we look at uh, the great apes, your chimpanzees, your bonobos, your gorillas, it's obvious that we share a number of characteristics with them, and that's because we share a common ancestor. So let's look at what those differences are, or what those similarities are, rather. Firstly, we all have opposable thumbs. An opposable thumb means that the thumb and your fingers move in opposite directions. This is what enables you to have the power grip where you can hold something in your hand very, very strongly or very uh, fastly. Um, in addition to having the power grip, human beings also have a precision grip. That's what we refer to as your fine motor control. Um, and that is one of the differences between us and the other apes. But we definitely share the power grip as a result of having an opposable thumb. Our fingertips. If you look at your fingertips, yours are bare. And so are the fingertips of all of the great apes. They don't have fur on their fingertips. We both share the fact that we have two arms and two legs. Uh, what we use those arms and legs for is different, but we both have two arms and two legs. And each of our limbs have five digits on them, five fingers or five toes. When you look at our nails, uh, if you think about a dog or a cat or anything else, they have claws. We have flat nails, and that is something that we share with all of the great apes. They also have flat nails. We have long arms. Um, if you think about birds or other species, their arms can be quite short or their arms could be much longer. Um, but with the great apes, we definitely share long arms. What is interesting about our arms is that our arms are freely rotating. If you think back to grade 10 when you learned about the skeleton and you learned about the different types of joints the freely rotating joint of the shoulder and the hip particularly they allow movement in 180 degrees or in fact uh, almost 360 degrees in one plane so you can swing your arm this is how you can swim and do crawl and backstroke is because your arm is able to rotate freely right round from top to bottom um, our movement from left to right with those joints is slightly more limited, uh, but nevertheless you can swing your arm around the front of you um, and you could swing it sort of almost past the 180 mark uh, to the 270 mark behind you in one plane from left to right. Our eyes, they look forwards. Now that is something that we share actually with all predators, not just with the great apes. So cats and dogs, uh, other other predators, they have their eyes at the front of their skull, not on the sides of their skulls. We have stereoscopic or binocular vision. This is what enables us to have 3D vision. Now, those of you who are taking maths, at some point you will do trigonometry, where you will use uh, cos, sine and cosine functions. Your brain does all of that without even thinking about it. Uh, calculates the angle between your two eyes and the object that you're looking at and from that is able to calculate the length of the sides of the triangle that are formed and therefore how far away something is from you. So your brain does that whole 3D thing without even thinking about it, does trigonometry without thinking about it. You have to still learn how to figure that out. When you look at the structure of the eyes, uh, the eyes if you think about dogs, for example, we're often told that dogs only see in black and white. That's not strictly speaking true. They do see in red-green color blindness, or they have that sort of red-green vision. But human beings and all of the great apes, we see in full color. We have cones as well as rods in our eyes. And when we do the nervous system, you will learn more about the structure of the eye. In relation to the size of our bodies, the volume of our brains is significantly large. Uh, much larger, the ratio between the size of our brain and the size of our bodies is much larger than for other species. When you look at the structure of the brain, which we'll also do when we do the nervous system later on, when you look at the structure of the brain, you will notice that the centers that are involved with vision and with your hands are significantly developed. Our sense of smell is not that great. Certainly, if you think about other species, uh, dogs, for example, their primary smell, their primary sense rather, is smell. Um, our primary sense is vision. So our sense of smell is greatly reduced, and therefore the center in the brain that is responsible for interpreting that is also significantly reduced. 
Now, there are a few terms that you will have to learn when you are describing uh, the similarities and differences in terms of anatomy. And one of those is prognathus. Prognathus refers to the shape of the jaw, whether the jaw sticks out from the face or not. In the exam, the Department of Education wants you to use the term prognathus and non-prognathus. So we don't refer to a developed jaw, we refer to a prognathous jaw. Uh, we don't refer to a lack of, of a sticking out jaw. We don't say it has you have a reduced jaw, we say you are non-prognathous. Okay, so you don't have, if you, again, if you think about dogs particularly, they've got a really long snout, their jaws really stick out from their face, so they are prognathous, we are non-prognathous. We do not have a snout that sticks out. Uh, and that is or not as great. Um, and that is common to all of the great apes. Again, if you think about other species, one of Darwin's observations was that many more offspring are born than survive to maturity. When you look at the great ape species, actually, we don't give birth to lots of young. We're not like fish who lay millions and millions of eggs in the hopes that one or two of them might survive. Instead, we give birth to one individual at a time, one offspring at a time. Sometimes we might have twins. More rarely, we will have triplets. If you have more than triplets, there's been some sort of artificial intervention. Uh, that's not normally, that's not usual in the normal, the normal scheme of things. So we tend to have fewer offspring. Our social behavior is very, very complex. Uh, there's not only a hierarchy, but there are means of maintaining those hierarchies that involve very complex behaviors. It's not just simply who's the biggest or who's the strongest. Although our embryos do have a tail, while we are still embryos, those tails are reabsorbed. Your tail bones remain. They are called your coccyx. Um, so the tail bones remain in place, but we don't actually grow a tail anymore. And that is common with all of the great apes. If you look at the other apes, uh, your lemurs or in the, the other simians and prosimians, their tails obviously do develop. So along the, along the line of our evolutionary development, uh, we have stopped developing a tail. Sexual dimorphism. Um, when you look at some species, it's not really easy to tell the difference between male and female. Uh, we do dis uh, display sexual dimorphism, separate male and female, and, and our dimorphism is quite significant. If you think of the gorillas, uh, we always talk about the silverbacks, those males who develop sort of grey or silver hairs on their back to identify them as the top dog, the top male. Looking at our teeth, uh, our teeth in general have more rounded cusps. Now that's not to say that we don't have sharp teeth. Uh, certainly if you look at a gorilla or a chimpanzee, they eat meat and so their cusps are quite uh, and their meat is raw. Remember, they don't, they don't make use of fire to soften or, or cook their meat in any way. Um, so their cusps are still quite sharp. But in comparison, for example, to a tiger or a leopard or something like that, uh, in general, the teeth of the great apes are much more rounded. Okay, if we look now at the differences, uh, this makes a really nice paragraph question, either of these two, two sections. Uh, so you could get a paragraph question on describe the similarities or you could get a paragraph question on describe the differences uh, between humans and great apes. So when we look at human beings, our faces are actually quite flat. We have no snout at all. Whereas if you look at this photograph of the chimpanzee, you can see the chimpanzee does still have a snout of some sort. It's not as big as a dog's or a, a tiger's, but it's definitely much smaller. Uh, so we share the fact that our snout is reduced, but when we look at the difference, human beings do not have a snout, whereas the other apes do have a small snout. When you look at our foreheads, our foreheads are absolutely vertical. They do not slope backwards. Um, so that we have what's called a flat forehead, whereas, whereas the other apes, when you look at their skulls, they do have a sloping forehead to some degree. As I said previously, we are non-prognathous. We do not have a protruding jaw whereas all the other great apes are prognathous, they have a protruding jaw. Because of the fact that we don't have a protruding jaw, we have developed a chin, and the other apes, uh, their chins are not as developed as ours. When you look inside the mouth at the shape of the jaw and the shape of the palate, the jaw, uh, the, the, the bottom part of your mouth that forms the bottom, you know, where your tongue sits, that is 
what we're referring to here when we refer to jaw. Uh, that is a very rounded shape. We refer to it as having a C shape. Whereas when you look at the other apes, the shape of their jaw is more U-shaped. Likewise, the top part of our mouths, the palate, uh, the hard and soft palate, those are also C-shaped rather than U-shaped, rounded. When you look at our dentition, at the structure of our teeth, and again, I would refer you back to the grade 10 syllabus where you learned about the different types of teeth and their functions. So for us, we do have canines, but our canines are in line with the rest of our teeth. They do not protrude beyond the line of the other teeth, so they're quite small. We do not have diastema. Diastema are only required when your canines protrude beyond the line of the other teeth, because then you've got to find a way of fitting those in with the lower or upper jaw without actually cutting yourself. So we don't have those diastema, those spaces. When you look at our molars and our premolars, our cusps are very flat in comparison, uh, and our enamel is much, much thicker. So that's what we have. Obviously, when you talk about the great apes, they have large canines, they do have diastema, their cusps are more pointed than ours, and their enamel is thinner. Uh, for most of us, we have a lot less body hair. There are some families uh, in the Amazon who there are, there's a particular tribe, and also I think in India, where the gene for hair on the body is such that actually they look like they have fur because they have so much hair on their body. But with that exception, the rest of us have very little fur, very little hair on our bodies in comparison to the great apes. When you look at the size of our skull, uh, the cranium and the brain in general. So we, we share with the great apes the fact that the ratio between the volume of our brain to our body mass is greater. But when you compare us to the other great apes, ours is much greater than theirs. There is a significant difference and our brains are significantly bigger. The ratio of the, the volume of our brains to the volume of our body mass is bigger. What we don't have are cranial and brow ridges. So our cranial ridges have disappeared entirely. Um, the great apes still have that, and I will show you some pictures in a moment of what those look like. Uh, and our brow ridges are also greatly reduced. In general, our skeleton is larger. Uh, theirs, in general, is a smaller skeleton. When you look at the shape of the vertebral column, remember we try to avoid the use of the word spine because that can be confusing between the spinal cord, which is the nerves that extend from the brain down through the middle of the vertebral column, and the vertebral column. So although lay people who've not done any science would refer to it as your spine, you are expected to refer to it as the vertebral column, okay? to, to distinguish between the bones and the nervous tissue. So the vertebral column, when you look at the vertebral column in human beings, we have an S-shaped vertebral column, whereas the other great apes have a more C-shaped vertebral column. Don't get the C-shape of the vertebral column confused with the C-shape of the rounded jaw. Okay, Make sure that you've got those two the right way around. Um, now the reason for that is because of the fact that we are bipedal, and we'll talk about that in a minute. One of the things that enables us to be bipedal is the fact that our foramen magnum, and again I refer you back to the grade 10 syllabus where you learned about the skeleton, the foramen magnum is the hole in the cranium through which the brain stem extends. So the nervous tissue that is your brain that then becomes your spinal cord, where that leaves your skull then obviously needs to be a hole in the skull and that hole is the foramen magnum. So the position of that foramen magnum is different. For us, it is right underneath our skull. It is, it is beneath the skull. Whereas for the great apes, it is at the back of the skull, slightly different position. And again, I'll show you some photos in a moment. Another effect of being bipedal is that our pelvis has become much shorter and much wider. Uh, if you are a great ape, your uh, pelvis is very narrow and very long. Non-opposable toes, obviously we don't climb trees anymore. Well, we do, but not as a mode of, of existence or mode of life. And so we don't need to grip the branches with our feet. So as a result of that, our big toes have stopped being opposable. So our hands and our feet look different. And instead, the big toe has shifted forward to be in line with the other toes. So we have non-opposable toes. When you look at the ratio of our arms and legs, because we don't walk on all fours, the ratio has shifted. If you look at your great apes, your arms and their arms and legs are more or less the same length to facilitate uh, walking on all fours or knuckle walking. 
uh, quadrupedal walking. For us, because we no longer walk on all fours, we only walk on two legs, our ratio of arms and legs has changed, and so our legs are much longer than our arms. Again, as a, as a feature of bipedalism, because we're now walking on two legs, shock absorbency becomes an issue uh, when you have the weight of the whole skeleton pushing down on the foot, and so the foot has become arched. If you look at a chimpanzee or a gorilla's foot, their foot is completely flat. There is no arch in that foot at all. And then lastly, um, the shape of our vocal cords has changed, um, and the vocal centers in our brains have changed. As a result, we are able to vocalize words, so we have artificial language. That doesn't mean to say that gorillas and chimpanzees are stupid. In fact, there are many zoos where gorillas and chimpanzees have been taught sign language, and they are able to communicate effectively using sign language. So it's not that they can't think in sentences like we do. It's not that they're stupid. It's just that they don't have the anatomical uh, vocal box that we do, or vocal cords that we do, and therefore they're not able to vocalize words they can only vocalize um, more guttural sounds and therefore they've not been able to develop language. But where you have gorillas or monkeys or chimpanzees, sorry, not monkeys, gorillas or chimpanzees or, or bonobos in captivity um, and they've been taught sign language, they actually teach that sign language to their children and their offspring are then able to communicate with human beings as well using the same sign language. All right, so let's have a look at some of these differences now using some visual aids. So on the left, you've got your human skull. On the right, uh, you've got a gorilla skull. Notice the volume of the, the brain box, the volume of the skull itself. So here, that is the area where your brain would be versus this is the area where the gorilla's brain is. Okay, so quite a different shape, quite a different size uh, in terms of volume. We'll also look at the jaw. So here is the lower jaw. Notice this massive jaw in comparison to our jaw. This is why they are able to, their bite is incredibly strong because they've got a massive bone here that muscles can attach to. Those muscles attach to the cranial ridge there at the top, and I'll show you a different slide in a moment uh, showing how just how uh, large that cranial ridge is. There is the brow ridge. The purpose of the brow is to prevent water from getting into the eyes. So the eyebrows and the brow ridge divert. Any rain that would fall onto the, the skull will run down and then be diverted away from the eyes. Notice the large canines. Notice the diastema, the spaces. We don't have any of that. Our canines are in line. There are no spaces. Notice the sloping forehead versus our vertical forehead. Uh, notice the jaw extends well beyond the edge of the face, whereas our jaw is in line with the rest. So we have a flat face okay, with non-prognathous jaw. They have a sloping face with a prognathous jaw that sticks out well beyond the face. Okay, there's again just looking at the brain volume. Notice that our brain volume is much larger. Okay, when we talk about the jaw and the palate shapes, we refer to C-shape versus U-shape. So here you can see the C-shape of our palate, or of our jaw rather, and the U-shape of their jaw. Pan troglodyte, uh, that's a chimpanzee. Okay, so just putting in some images there to make it absolutely clear. Notice the spacing between the teeth here. There's your diastema. That's the space where the canine from the upper jaw would then slot into the lower jaw without actually cutting the individual. Okay, there's the flat face versus the sloping face, the non-prognathous jaw versus the prognathous jaw. Okay, when you look at the cranial ridges here, you can see on this photograph, there is the actual cranial ridge. Um, the ear muscles and jaw muscles ultimately attach to this cranial ridge as well as attaching to uh, the ridges across the side of the face here, the zygomatic arches and things. Okay, the brow ridge. We do have a teeny tiny little brow ridge, uh, but it's not very big. All right, the foramen magnum. Now, the foramen magnum, when you look underneath the skull, this is the human being's skull. There you can see our more C-shaped versus the U-shaped uh, jaw. And here is our foramen magnum. This is the hole through which our spinal cord will leave the brain. 
There is the foramen magnum for the chimpanzee. Notice ours is central and underneath, theirs is at the back. Okay, so when you look at the side view on, here is our foramen magnum and our spine, our spinal cord leaves the skull underneath. Theirs is sitting more at the back and it leaves more horizontally from the skull. So when we look at the pivot, uh, and you will have done pivots in your technology courses in grade eight and grade nine, when we look at the pivot, the pivot for the human skull is much lower down and underneath the skull, whereas the pivot for the others is at the back of the skull. Okay, And that is a, a crucial feature when you are looking up uh, skeletons, when you're digging skeletons up out of the ground, uh, if you're an archaeologist or a paleon, uh, paleontologist. That's one of the crucial things that you will look for is where is the position of that foramen magnum because that will tell you whether the individual that you're looking at, whether the fossil that you're looking at, the skull that you're looking at, is bipedal or quadrupedal. And if it's bipedal, then it is a direct ancestor for human beings. All right, let's look at that uh, spine shape. So here you can see we've taken a gorilla and we've turned the gorilla to stand on two feet. Uh, just at that point, bipedal means that our mode of, of transportation, our mode of life, our mode of walking is always on two feet. It doesn't mean we can't walk on all fours. Babies crawl on all fours. Okay, That doesn't make them quadrupedal. Likewise, the other great apes, their primary mode is on all fours. They are quadrupedal. That doesn't mean that they can't stand up and walk on two legs. So when you see chimpanzees and gorillas, they will sometimes uh, stand up and walk on two legs. That doesn't make them bipedal. Okay, they are quadrupedal, and sometimes they will be bipedal in their mode. We are bipedal, and sometimes we are quadrupedal in our mode. All right, so here we've turned the gorilla skeleton up so that it's standing on two legs to be able to compare the shape. You can see quite nicely here the S shape of the human being versus the more kind of C shape of the gorilla. Now, I grant you that one's not hugely uh, convincing. So let's look at a chimp here. You can see the chimp. There's a nice C shape there versus the S shape for the human beings. And just in case you really couldn't see it, there it is drawn in for you to show you the C shape and the S shape. When we look at the pelvic girdle, the pelvic girdle obviously is your hips made up of those three bones, the ilium, ischium, and pubis, uh, three on each side. So you actually have two ilium, two uh, pubis, and two ischiums that are fused together, one on the left, one on the right, and then in the back they are joined onto the last part of your vertebral column and by this pubic ligament at the front. Okay, so you've got the three bones joined together there, three bones fused together there, joined to each other via the vertebral column at the back and the pubic uh, joint or ligament at the front. Um, that structure becomes important later on when we do human reproduction and we look at birth and how women are able to give birth. Um, and we look at the progression of pregnancy, that the way that the, the pelvic girdle is structured becomes important then. All right, when we look at the pelvic girdle between human beings and the apes, here you can see quite clearly that ours is much flatter and much wider. Theirs is much longer and much narrower. Okay, And that is because of the fact that we are bipedal. When we are bipedal, when organisms are bipedal, their weight is pulled down by gravity in a vertical way, resulting in all the weight of the upper body resting here on the pelvis. That means that that pelvis has to become more bowl-shaped in order to support the upper body more, or to support the weight of the upper body more effectively. When you are quadrupedal, your weight is dis uh, dispersed across your body at different points, obviously still vertical, but that means that the pelvis is not carrying the weight of the body. Uh, it's only carrying the weight of the lower portion, the abdomen. The rest of the weight, your skull, your rib cage, etc., is actually carried at the front of the skull, uh, front of the body. And so as a result, what this pelvis is more kind of functionally suited for is just for movement. It doesn't have to carry a huge amount of weight. Okay, just showing you. Um, Australopithecus afarensis, that is one of our direct ancestors, uh, southern apes, uh, and you can see there that it fits between the modern chimpanzee and the modern human being. Please notice that afarensis uh, being a, a direct ancestor, ancestor is also an ancestor of the chimpanzees. 
Okay, there's a shared common ancestor between us. All right, so what is the advantage of being bipedal? Why might we have become bipedal? Why might natural selection have driven this? Firstly, when you stand upright, uh, those of you who enjoy swimming, when you have been swimming and it's been really cold in the pool, when you get out, what do you do? You lie down on the bricks or the stones next to the pool. Why? Because you are exposing more of your surface area to direct solar radiation as well as radiation from the ground. So when you have a surface area that is perpendicular um, to the sun, obviously you heat up more quickly. When you have a surface area that is smaller, that is perpendicular, you heat up more slowly. Likewise, the first meter or so next to the ground, that is where the heat of the sun that has been absorbed by the earth and is re-radiated back out, that's where the majority of that heat is sitting, is in that first meter. So if you can raise your body above that first meter, you will tend to be cooler. You will also experience more wind being higher up, and so it means that trying to maintain your body temperature becomes easier. Uh, you have less solar radiation to deal with, more wind, and you are in a cooler environment in general. So that's one of the, the significant advantages, advantages of bipedalism. Another advantage of bipedalism, obviously, is that your eyes are higher up, which means that you can see further. You're not obstructed by bushes or low-growing things. Uh, that means that you're more likely to be able to A, see where food is, and B, see where your predators might be. A third advantage of bipedalism is that because you're now only walking on two legs, you now have two limbs that are free for you to do other things with. So you can, for example, carry things while walking, or you can feed yourself while walking, or you can defend yourself while walking. You can shoot bows and arrows, for example. So there are a number of advantages to being bipedal.